Testing. All right. Hello and welcome to another Coalesce session, yet another one. Uh, my name is Andrew Tom. I am a senior data analyst at DBT Labs um, and also your MC. So this is a super exciting talk for me just because I think the content is especially relevant. Um, and in just a second, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this talk titled Analyst to Analytics Engineer. Now, before I introduce our speaker, uh, quick housekeeping first is all chat conversation and QA will take place in the Coalesce Analyst to Analytics Engineer channel. So as the, over, over the course of the talk, feel free to drop your, your comments and questions in, and then Brittany will be able to answer those after the session is over. Um, if you're not already part of the uh, DBT Slack, what you doing? You should join at community.getdbt.com. And now, I'd like to introduce to the stage our speaker, Brittany. Brittany Croth is a Analytics and Insights uh, is a manager of Analytics and Insights at Degreed. Um, Degreed has an upscaling platform. She's passionate about building a company-wide data-driven culture. And most importantly, in her spare time, Brittany has talents that could really be its own talk. Everything from competing in dog agility to training donkeys. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the stage. Uh, Hi everyone, so we're here today to talk about Analyst to Analytics Engineer. Um, so yeah, my name is Brittany Croft, um, Manager of Analytics and Insights at Degreed. Uh, so this is my first time presenting to like a live human audience. Uh, I've practiced in front of my donkeys uh, and they say it's great, so hopefully that, that works. Um, so we're gonna be talking about this journey from an analyst to, hey, I wanna learn some analytics engineering skills. Um, and so if I leave you with one thought today, it would be this, that analysts make fantastic analytics engineers. Um, and so to do that, I need to convince you of the why and the how. I need to convince you why you should teach your analysts to do analytics engineering things, and I also need to teach you how you can do that. Like, how are you gonna train these skills? Um, and so I want to give a little bit of background of uh, how degree structures are our data teams. So we have a data engineering team, we have our analyst team, so I'm the manager of all the analysts. Uh, data engineers brought in our raw t data, and then our analysts create our dashboards and our ad hoc and our product analytics. Uh, and so we said, wow, this is really hard, like trying to use this raw data. Um, and so when we got DBT, they were like, oh, well, there's this thing called analytics engineering. It's so easy. You just have someone in the middle building beautiful curated data sets. And we said, perfect, love it. Um, and so like, if you think of this as like a library, we were having data engineers bring a bunch of raw books to our doorstep and was like, here you go, here's the books. And then the analysts were trying to figure out how to read the books to generate insights. And like ideally, you'd have a librarian. You'd have someone who's putting the books on the bookshelf and adding a Dewey Decimal System to make it more efficient. Um, but we're a startup, so we can't just go hire a whole team of analytics engineers. As so we said, well, what if we teach our analysts enough skills of analytics engineering that they can build their own curated data sets, that they can start actually using DBT to build the data that they need? Um, and so that's what we're gonna talk through today. And we're gonna do it using an example project because to me the easiest way is to do this in the flow of work, in the flow of a project. Um, so this is our question from a stakeholder. Uh, I need some data on active users uh, for our clients, which could mean like any of a thousand things. Um, and so an analyst is really good at breaking down this question into like a thousand other questions. I don't know why that one's purple. That's okay, they're all important questions. Like is this a one-time ask? Do I need to make a whole dashboard for it? Is active users related to logins? Is it related to, I clicked on the shopping cart? Um, clients, how do you define clients? Like is it in Salesforce, what fields? There's so much that goes into that initial question that analysts are really good at collecting that info and getting that context. Um, and so typically an analyst will take that info and say, okay, well, I'm gonna do three things. I'm gonna give you a quick answer right now, or I might do a basic dashboard in the next month, 
or I might do an advanced dashboard and it's going to take a long time. It's going to take like six months or a year. Uh, or you might do some combination of all three. Um, when you're looking to move from analyst to an analytics engineer, you typically take it one step further and you start saying, well, these are going to be my like epics and then these are going to be all my individual tasks and all my individual tickets. And then from there, you can start applying things like iteration and agile methodologies, and you can keep continuing down this road of engineering software best practices. But it all starts with really tracking your work at that like, individual task level. Um, OK, so we've kind of figured out what we want, uh, and so we write up our requirements. So I want this kind of table. It's got to have a date field. Uh, I need to have active users. And I drew a pretty picture so I know exactly what it's going to look like at the end. Uh, and then the data surprises you. Like, I think every time I've built a model, something happens and I'm not expecting. Um, so like, maybe there's two date fields. And I'm like, well, there should only be one. I don't know why there's two. Or maybe there's duplicate rows, and I thought a count was fine, but now I got a question, is it a distinct count or not? Um, if an analyst is the one building the model, there's no, there's no handoff. It's not like this back and forth questions with another like, engineer somewhere. They're just talking to themselves. And they're sorting through using all the context that they gain from the stakeholder and bringing that together with the new information of what they're finding in the raw data. Because the analysts kind of know what they want and what's going to help answer the question that the stakeholder brought. Um, so like the first main big technical thing you have to know is SQL. Some analysts know no SQL. Some analysts know a lot of SQL. And this journey of SQL knowledge is a big component of what really turns you into an analytics engineer. Uh, if you don't know SQL, like, you're not going to be able to get there. Um, and so trying to level up so you know, you know all the joins, you know how to do aggregations, and then you can keep going and going to more and more complicated SQL. Um, my big fan is select statements. I'm like, I think select statements are like the thing you have to know. And I don't worry about the other ones. I just I check Stack Overflow if I need them. <laughs> Um, so depending on where the analyst is at, there's a few different ways I have them approach learning SQL. Um, if they're a pretty beginner, there's some great online courses, most of them free, that you can check out. Um, and then I like to do things at work. So like if you have an ad hoc question, rather than just pulling it from your BI tool, I'll say, well, why don't you try to do it in Snowflake first? Like try to query there and see if they match up. Um, the other thing is a lot of analysts aren't used to like pair programming, but like it's so common in engineering. And so applying that pair programming concept can really help upskill uh, an analyst faster. Um, so let's talk about DBT, because DBT is what makes all of this really possible. Um, so once an analyst feels comfortable, oh yeah, I'm in Snowflake, I got my query, this is what I want to build my table every day, um, converting it to DBT is like so fast. And because this is so fast is what makes analysts be like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Like, it's got to have a config. I copy paste my SQL, add the references to my table names, and I'm done. Um, and what makes that extra fast is having standards. So like that config section can be a little scary if you're like, well, I don't want to break everything. Like what, they have to add certain tags or what else needs to go in there. But if I have some templates, then I know. Like, okay, if I'm making this kind of model, this is what needs to go in the config. Um, if you have some kind of like data dictionary that has different requirements of how are you going to name things or a style guide. Some people use like a, like a linter or you could just have a confluence page and just be like, hey, it's written down at least. Like, are we using snake case or are we using camel case? Um, and so when you're doing peer reviews, it's not this big question of did I code this in a good way? Instead, it's does it fit the requirements? So an analyst can almost like self-review and feel more confident before they actually hand it off for a real peer review. Um, what ends up happening is analysts usually start getting more and more complex in their queries. So if they want to do something really creative, uh, oftentimes it's hard to convince themselves, oh, I'm going to hand it to an engineer and ask them to take their time on something that may or may not work out. But if an analyst is ever able to code it themselves, they're like, I'll give it a shot. Why not? Let's try this like, funky table structure. Let's try some complicated business logic, and let's see if it works. Um, so, for example, they might say, I don't want just daily active users. I want to split it up a few ways. I want to have a few different groups. 
Um, and so maybe based on that conversation with the stakeholder, they talked a lot about the participant role and the admin role and the differences. So you're like, okay, I'll, I'll split those out. But then you get something like this where the columns just like don't add up. And it's like, well, why do participants plus admins not equal all users? Um, and this really gets into the question of, was this on purpose? Like, is this a feature of the table? Like, it's meant to be this way? Or is this a bug and something's wrong and they are supposed to add up? Um, and analysts are really good at this. They're really good at just questioning everything about the data and thinking of it in that context of the original question and the original business ask. Um, so like maybe it's just because there's unexpected values. Maybe there's nulls in there. And then you can account for this. Um, and so typically, data validation can then begin really early in the process. Instead of saying, I want this whole table, and then being given the whole table, an analyst can start coding it and be like, OK, well, I'm going to check group A, and I'm going to make sure group A is good. And then group B, then I'll do group B. Or you can kind of do things in, in parallel. or um, So like maybe group C, they're arguing about definitions. And like you don't have to stop the production of the whole table because group C is not finished yet. You can keep working on the others, and maybe you ship a V1 and then ship a V2 later. And so you start seeing a lot more iteration. Um, so I want to spend some time on Git, because Git is probably the most daunting thing to analysts. There is so much to Git, and I swear the documentation like needs documentation so you can know how to read it. Um, and so I typically start with just talking about like environments. Um, so like you've got some kind of dev or local environment. This is where you can play around in your safe little space. And then you need to have somewhere where people can check and see, is this actually like good code? This is the one that I'm happy with. And so at Degreed, we have environments for every individual pull request. Uh, and so you can see like this is what's going to look like when it's, when it's merged. And then we have our final production. Um, and so this is very natural to most analysts because it's very similar to how they do dashboards. They often have a personal area for dashboards. They have some area where they can collaborate with other analysts and stakeholders. And then you have some kind of final published dashboard area. And this might be environments, but more often than not, it's like a folder structure or a naming convention. Um, and so I typically say, like, well, what do you actually need to know to build that curated data set? It's probably only like a handful of things. Like, how many merge conflicts are you going to have when like, you're probably the only team working on your own like, little folder of BI models. Uh, and so we have a lot of like, how-to guides, like this is the steps to do. Uh, and then when we get stuck, we just go ask our data engineers. Like if we get some like, crazy thing and we blew up our like, local environment, like, we have those resources um, to be able to ask them to assist us. Uh, and I also like DBT's resources a lot because they're a little bit more specific on Git to like, what you're going to see when you're building models. Um, I'm going to skip that slide and go to this one, because I want to talk about testing for a minute. Um, so there's kind of two different ways that we like to think about testing. Um, one is the initial validation, and the second is future proofing. And when we think of testing, we often think of them like all smushed together, but really we kind of use different skills to do each one. Um, on the initial validation, we want to say, like, are we confident for this purpose? Does it need to be 80% correct, or does it need to be 99.99999% correct? Like, those are two very different levels of validation that I have to do. Um, and so for, like, technical skills associated with it, to me, it's the tools. Like, if I'm familiar with the tools, then I can run with it. Like, I don't have to spend my time trying to figure out how to make a pivot table, because I already know how to make a pivot table. And I can focus on the validation itself. Uh, and this is where, like, I start seeing people sometimes use Python. You don't need to use Python. But, like, it's a way of using Python in a, in, in a way that you can understand. So rather than trying to be like, I'm going to do a regression model in Python, and you're like, you don't know how to do regression, and you don't know how to use Python. Like, now I'm, like, doing two hard things at once. Using Python for something like validation lets you focus on just how do I use Python? And then once you know Python, you can do the more complicated machine learning things. Um, the other side is future proofing. So um, a lot of times when you're building tests, there's the question of well, what actually matters. Um, if you have a column that has 20 values and it jumps to 25, like maybe that's OK because it's like states. And you're like, as long as it stays under 50 states, like we're good. 
Or maybe it's something like product SKUs, and you're like, well, no, we only have 20. Like, we didn't release another product. Like, that's an error. And so it really comes down to um, if this were to be different, like, are you going to get a call from someone? Like, is someone going to call the analyst and be like, hey, what just happened to my dashboard? And so analysts are often really good at that because they know what they're going to get the call on. Um, so trying to be as proactive as possible instead of reactive to these data quality issues, um, rather than being notified by the user, a lot of analysts are putting alerts on dashboards. Um, but an analytics engineer would take that one step further. They would say, well, I want to put tests in DBT. I want to get that upstream data to be checked on. Um, which brings up some analytics engineering things that an analyst probably has never had to think about. They never had to think about where do I want to get these alerts? Do I want them in Slack? Do I want them in Airflow? Do I want them in DBT Cloud? Um, what's my response time? Like, if this goes off, do I need to wake up at 2 a.m. and fix it? Like, probably not, but like, it's something to think about. And who is going to respond to these? And when are they going to respond to these? Are you going to rotate, or is it always the same person? Um, and so, when actually building these tests in DBT, um, like my team is, oh, well, I'll just write up a list and then an engineer will go throw it in DBT. And it ends up like taking more time than if they just wrote it in a YAML to start with. <laughs> um, as long as I remember to space the correct number of spaces. Um, <laughs> so um, my, what I've also found with my team is we, like, we start with a lot of the built-in tests um, and then we'll start creating more and more custom stuff. And a lot of analysts seem to uh, go from like very simple, I'm going to do the most basic tests, to I'm going to do the most complicated, complicated test in the world that errors like every day. And then they, as they go between these two extremes, they start to kind of Goldilocks in the middle to where they actually are using tests that are like erroring and they're actionable and they actually matter. Um, and so I kind of I let that happen as they find that perfect middle. Um, the other side, so we got um, our model, we got our tests, and now we got to document it. Uh, and analysts, in my opinion, are really good at documenting because they understand how much of a pain it is to come back to a data set to use it again, and it's just like, I have no clue what this is. Um, and so my hypothesis, this is, this is my theory, is that good documentation is based on how to use the data set, not how to build it. So I'm going to show an example. Um, so say that we're defining group B. If I document it as these are the users that are using the add-on product, you know, they're in beta, and here's a date, and it's recommended not to use them in this metric. Like, this is tons of information that six months from now when I'm looking back, it's helpful for me. It's additional context for me that I might not remember from back then. Or someone else might be using it, and they can use it. How to build it would be giving me the case when statement. Like, the case one statement's not helpful. If I need the case one statement, I'll go in the code itself, and I can see exactly how it's built. What I need for documentation is the how to use it. Um, and so when we're using our um, YAML and putting our description, like, my team doesn't, like, write a description of model in there. We always use those markdown files. And so those markdown files really allow us to say, okay, sit down and think about this. Like, write down everything that could be helpful in six months when you or another team member are looking back. Um, okay, so we've ran through a whole project. I talk kind of fast. <laughs> and we talked about a lot about this question. And um, I wanted to show kind of the summary because we talked about three different files. Uh, but this is like really the core of if you want to create a curated data set, it's not just the SQL file. If you just have a SQL file, it's not enough. You need a model description, you need a YAML with some tests. And then this combined together, the three of them, is what really drives awesome curated data sets. Um, and we also talk through a lot of skills along the way. And so the goal with going from analyst to analytics engineer isn't this like deep dive 100%, I want to know everything there is to know. Like take it in small steps. Let's learn a little bit about Git. Let's get a little bit better in our SQL. Let's start adding alerts. Let's start creating standards. And before you know it, you're going to wake up one day and call yourself an analytics engineer. Uh, so thank you all for joining. I hope I've convinced you that analysts really do make fantastic analytics engineer. Um, that's it. Thank you.